Harvey. Merci, merci. Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. I apologize, my French is not up to par uh, to speak on such an important topic, so I will be speaking in English, and I hope that is okay with all of you. You can vote with your uh, boos or yays as I speak. What I'd like to do today is, is begin by taking you on a short journey, a journey backwards in times about 150 years, and then we'll zoom through today forward to what I believe might be 25 years away. And in that journey, we'll explore how it's possible to achieve a 100% renewable future. Then I'll talk a little bit about the transition and how the transition will likely happen and what's needed to make the transition. And then lastly, if I don't screw up the timing, we'll talk a bit about why it's so important to make the transition. So if you come back with me, close your eyes if you want. Let's go back to about 1850. That was the last time the world lived on a renewable energy-based planet. We had not yet quite jammed through the Industrial Revolution. Most people got their power from local sources, whatever they could find. Urban centers were starting to explore new energy sources like coal. And the primary source for the industrialized world were a certain couple, couple natural oils, the kind of most popular of which was sperm whale oil. And we were harvesting the global oceans, taking sperm whales out of the ocean, taking the oil out of their snouts, and powering the world. And the wealthiest people in the world at that time controlled the sperm whale oil market. Then something happened in 1850. There was the discovery of oil in Pennsylvania in the United States. And within 20 years, not simply because of the discovery of oil, but within 20 years, the sperm whale oil market was all but gone. And oil became the dominant source of energy power, of energy, for the globe. And that was a game changer. For two reasons. It sparked the end of our ability to live in a renewable way in the world. And two, it addicted us to a new form of energy, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But it also, the speed with which it happened is important because today people will tell you it takes 50, 60, 70, 100 years to change an energy system. Well, we saw it happen in 25 in the late 1800s, and I'm here to tell you today, I think you're going to see it happen in your lifetimes and in definitely the lifetimes of your children. Prior to oil, the world used largely low-value energy sources. It, it, had, it was able to convert some wood to energy or coal to energy in, in, by burning it. And you got, you got very little, in a grand, on a relative scale compared to oil, very little energy out of those sources. But oil changed the game. You were able to get a lot of energy out of that oil. And what that allowed us to do was to set off a new course in history called the Industrial Revolution, where we took that energy and built up the global superpowers of today. Now, most people would say that's a good thing. We have... We have a global productivity today, we have a, a, a wealth and a, and a level of prosperity in lots of parts of the world that was only available from oil. Of course, we all know there's a lot of the world, probably more than half of the world today, that did not benefit from that. And the challenge is the systems that were set up to run that oil and ultimately to produce the electricity that powers the developed world aren't really well set up for those who don't live in those countries. So here we stand today, the, benefit, the benefactors of all of that renewable, or I mean, all of that fossil fuel-based power. And many of my predecessors that have been up on stage today have talked about the technical challenges of moving forward. But I'll tell you that it may not be just the technical challenges of moving forward, 
Think of the institutions that we set up to make the world work today. Institutions that rely on the sale of fossil fuels to fund their countries, to fund their companies. Think of, if you're a developed country in the world today, can you imagine what would happen if you didn't have the tax revenue from the oil productions and sales in your country if you're a producer? Or if you didn't have the jobs created by using that oil to run industry? It's a very scary prospect, both economically and politically, to make that change. So maybe some of the barriers that we should be talking about aren't just the technical barriers, of which I think there's far fewer than people want to tell you, and, and some of the bigger barriers. The barriers related to institutional finance, global politics, and corruption. But now let's take a quick jump forward and maybe do it in a way where you think of the lives you want your children to have or your grandchildren to have. Or think of, if you know a young person today, think of their world and what that world will look like 20 years from now. We've already seen a massive convergence in the world between information, entertainment, our daily lives. A convergence that's been brought about by the information technology revolution. Largely by the cell phone, a disruptive technology that didn't exist 25 years ago. And in its creation and in its proliferation around the world, hasn't just revolutionized the telecommunications world, it's revolutionized every aspect of our jobs. It's changed the way we work. It's changed the way we interact. It's expanded our horizons beyond our local community to global. That's the kind of change that will continue because it makes lives better in the developing world and it makes lives better in the developed world. And if you think about a world where everybody is connected and everybody values the ability to reach out beyond their local borders and, and the lines blur between work and play and the lines blur between home and away, Think about the kind of energy that's needed to make that happen. And I will tell you, I don't believe it looks like oil produced in Saudi Arabia, stripped around the world, burnt or mixed in a refinery and burnt in some fossil fuel plant and then brought to me. I think it looks a lot like the technology our youth are using today. It's localized. It's personalized. And you can imagine a future not too far away where you and I are able to work and produce wealth based on the energy I can produce on my own footprint. You've already seen people's clothing be able to turn into energy production, capturing the waste and energy of motion. As batteries get better, the ability to carry around a computer and a communications device and connect with the world and produce value from right here. I can become a a singular economic unit using just the energy that I can produce around me. That energy will not come from oil and gas. That energy will come from motion, wind, the sun, and it will allow me to become a productive worker in the world. And it doesn't matter whether I live in Denver, Colorado, or Paris, France, or Nairobi, or the outback of Australia, as long as I have access to the sun and the wind and my own energy production, and global communications networks, I can be a productive asset. That's the world we're heading to, and it takes a very different type of energy. Now, we'll always need to have large, high-quality energy to run our, our large-scale manufacturing organizations, to produce the raw materials we need. And that's a different story than personal power consumption. But again, we don't believe it has to come from coal oil, and nuclear. In fact, rethinking the energy system to provide those large energy centers is not that hard. Techn technically, it's quite feasible. We're working with mines around the world today who have never used renewables to an extent to, to produce as much as 50% of their power from renewables. And the barrier is more mental than it is technical. They don't believe it can happen. They don't believe they can do it economically. But when we give them the confidence that can be done, they're adopting it. And the interesting thing is, 
the intermittency of that renewables, they're not necessarily fixing that by firming it up with diesel generators or firming it up with the grid. They're actually changing the way they're oper they'll operate. They'll shift more of their power demand at a time when the sun is shining or the time when the wind is blowing and reduce their power demand when it's not. That's far better than having their utility call them and saying, hey, we need more power to supply Soweto, so we're shutting you down for the next month or taking 20% of your power arbitrarily for the next week. You can't operate a large industrial organization that way. So we're developing solutions for them that work well in their environment. So let's talk briefly about how the transition can work. People will tell you it's a technical problem. I will tell you, yes, there's technical challenges, but it's not a technical problem. We have to rethink the design of our electrical system. We have to stop thinking about what, what they call base load power, which is there's, we have to produce this much, and therefore we have to have a very stable or stable oversupply of power. We know already that we can think of that demand side as flexible. We can create market systems that allow people who use power to participate in the market to say, you know what? The utility today wants to pay me for using less power. I'm willing to do that. Or maybe they'll pay me for taking a shower later in the afternoon and washing my clothes earlier. And we are very close to having a technical revolution that will automate that kind of communications and streamline the transactions between those kind of communications so that it's technically feasibly and economically feasible. I don't know if many of you were at the blockchain uh, part of the conference yesterday. There are technologies out there that make those transactions simple, ubiquitous, and fungible around the world. And that's going to change the way our electricity system works. So as I conclude, if I could do one thing today, please help me end the myth that it's a technical challenge. And let's raise awareness that this is a social challenge. It's a political challenge. It's an economic challenge and it's a geopolitical challenge. As long as the governments of the world rely on oil, to produce their wealth and to create competitive advantage, that's the real challenge. I'm out of time. I thank you very much for your attention, and hopefully you've enjoyed my conversation. Merci beaucoup.